Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here dropping in. Hope everybody has had a great day and a great start to your week. Uh, before I get started, I have to remind you guys we are in the middle of a fundraiser. If you know what we do at the Odyssey Project, if you're familiar with the work that I do in the community on multiple levels and different veins, uh, show your love, show your support. We're definitely pushing for support with Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage initiative uh, for young black boys to help properly socialize them into black manhood and also wraparound services for black men and their families. Uh, everything from job training, job help search, uh, mental health support, and more. Uh, these services are integral into the rebuilding of our community, the reestablishment of the black family nucleus and the redirection of where we're headed currently. Uh, I am asking that you support the work we're doing uh, by going into the description box and clicking the link and giving what you feel uh, you are comfortable with giving or you can also give through the organization's cash app account which is also listed in the description box. Now I want to talk to you about something uh, that I think uh, isn't addressed enough and when it is it's done in a comical uh, manner that looks at the funny side which I don't see but what most people appear or feel is a funny side of things and it's a, it's a little joke floating around. I saw a, I want to say it was a meme, but it was definitely a post on social media that basically said, um, that we need to teach our sons that honor roll is cooler than death roll. And I get what was uh, what the attempt was. I get where they were going with that because there's this idea that being smart isn't cool. There's this idea that having a well-rounded education, and I'm talking far more than the attainment of academic skills. And anyone who has followed me or read any of my books on education, you know that. I identify and define education as being the holistic prepare, preparation and empowerment of our youth to go out into a world that's inherently hostile towards them and not only compete but win. Uh, so it's not just about uh, what they do in the public schools or even in private schools or charter schools. It's about what we do in the home first. It's about preparing them. And the first step in preparing uh, a child to be productive is to socialize them. It is to make sure that they are established in understanding who they are, that they have an identity that they are anchored in so that when things get crazy and people are presenting alternatives to them, they know who they are. And because they know who they are, they know what's expected of them. They know what they're capable of. That's holistic education and we're lacking that. But there should be a desire to know oneself in a way that you're pursuing your greater self, your greater purpose your point, your role, your identity, your place in the community. Unfortunately, when we don't teach those kids, when we don't properly socialize them, like with what we do at Black Man Lead, what ends up happening is uh, society, uh, institutions outside of our spectrum, institutions outside of our power and control should tell them who they are. They tell them through a number of different ways. They ostracize them and alienate them in the public school system, especially black boys. As early as five years old, young black boys are identified as ADHD, uh, oppositionally defiant, uh, other learning disorders. They are, at five years old, many are prescribed psychotropic drugs like Vyvanse, Concerta, Ritalin, um, and to, in order for them to be still and sit still in the course, they are literally sedated um, at, at, in some level, but they're being given Schedule II drugs. If you don't know what a Schedule II drug is, scheduling drugs is, a drug, is, is the way that the government has of determining uh, the medical use of a drug 
uh, in reference to whether or not it has any medical use and um, schedule one drugs, stuff like heroin and cocaine and things of that nature that have no medical use are uh, simply completely out. Heroin in different forms, opiates are used as painkillers. So you got opiates in schedule two, but you got Ritalin, Vyvanse, Concerta, uh, and, and, and a number of others that are given to kids who are diagnosed with ADHD. They are medicated and started as early as five years old. Um, and these schedule two drugs are psychotropic drugs. They impact the brain's functions and the brain's chemical balance. And they are being given to five-year-old kids because someone said they had ADHD, which is one of the most over and misdiagnosed uh, mental conditions uh, in the entire spectrum of mental conditions in the DSM-5. Okay, now that we talked about that, what happens? They go in there, they're told they're not liked, they're told they're not accepted, they're told they're not smart enough, they're told they're not, they don't fit in. Uh, after a while, they become ostracized, they become uh, disenfranchised with the entire system, they become aloof, and uh, the chance and the risk of them dropping out of school increases. Okay, and then when they drop out of school, guess what happens? Then we have studies that tell us in Criminology 101 and Penology 101, it tells us that uh, uh, any kid that drops out of school, especially a male who drops out of school, is five times more likely uh, to be incarcerated at some point or in the course of their lives. Uh, what happens when you drop out of school? Well, despite what we know about the public school system, there is still some very uh, interesting facts that when you complete school, just a high school education, you're less likely to go to prison. If you were to go to college, you're no less likely to go to prison. But what does that mean? That means that despite the system not really being set up for us, the more prepared you are to walk into the world and make an honest living and be able to search and support your family, the less likely you are to become involved in criminal activity, meaning you're less likely to be arrested and sent to prison. So the one thing we understand that there's a direct line uh, from school to prison. It's called the school to prison pipeline. It's literally where they start studying our young boys at around third grade or fourth grade to see what kind of grades they're getting, their attendance, their disciplinary records. And they can literally use those disciplinary records, those attendance records, those grades to predict how many prison beds they're going to fill 15 years from now. That's how specific the science has come to be able to understand how ostracizing young black boys can lead to more prison beds, which means more money. The average prisoner is worth $40,000 a year. On average. And we're talking millions. Now, that, 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 that's just on the, on the surface, but if they're productive, if they are gifted their places, they're getting used and they're getting paid penny on the, pennies on the dollar. Or if you're in a state like Texas where I live, uh, you don't get paid what you get. And now because uh, federal law said that you cannot make a inmate work without some form of compensation, the way that Texas compensates is what, by what they call good time. What is good time? Good time is for every day that you get up and you go to work, you do your job, you're not written up, uh, you know, you are what, quote unquote, a model prisoner, um, slave, a model prisoner. Don't get me wrong, if you do something wrong, you should definitely have to pay the consequences. But when the system is set up to ensure that you go left and you go left, uh, I think that we have to be aware of that. And one of the things we have to do is we have to make sure our boys stop going left. And that's what this is about. But anyway, in, in Texas, okay, you get this good time, right? So what happens is that's natural parole, the natural parole process, which means that most crimes, you can start being eligible for parole within a year or two of serving your time, unless it's an aggravate, uh, aggravated offense. And then it's a certain percentage of your time. So, um, you know, you at most aggravated offenses, I think you have to do half of your time before you're eligible for parole. But if it's not an aggravated offense, you can uh, have a 15-year sentence and actually be up for parole in about two years. Uh, whether you make it or not, that's a whole nother, uh, whole nother discussion for another time. What I want to talk about is the good time, because that's how you're being actually paid for the work they do. And trust me, they work the hell out of inmates. Ain't nothing but cotton and and, and farming and, and furniture building and all that kind of stuff down here in Texas. And anyway, what happens is 
for every good day you work, that's considered a good, for every day you work and you don't get wrote up, that's a good day. So imagine your good days start at the end of your sentence. Say you got a 10 year sentence. And so you were in for a day, but you also get credit for a good day. So that moves you to, that day counts as two. So it's two days, one coming off the end of your sentence and one that you've actually worked. When your good time meets your actual serve time, you're considered to have completed your sentence because you've earned that good time by actually working. Now, here's what happens in Texas, though. It, when you are granted release based on your good time or parole, the good time that you earned at the exit when you're leaving the gate, you have to sign that good time back over to the state. So you don't get to keep it. It's In other words, you leave there, even if you served all of your good time or if you served a lot of good time and you only have a few, maybe a couple of months or maybe a couple of years on your sentence because of the good time you served, you have to sign that back. So when you leave, you're on parole for the full amount you didn't serve, even though you earned it. It'll get you out but you don't get to keep it. So they keep you on parole, why? Because that's the parole is the quickest way to get you back. Because I can literally violate you on parole for not, you don't have to break a law, you just have to have a technical violation. A technical violation can be something as simple as not returning to a halfway house before curfew. Or a technical violation can be something as simple as leaving the county or leaving the state without permission. Just you know, stuff that would normally not be considered a crime, uh, but is a technical violation because you are still under supervision. Well, these are just ways that it's set up. So what do we do? We need to properly socialize these young black males. And we need to be socializing our young girls too. Something else we do work on here at the Odyssey Project. That's something that my wife, Marion, uh, puts a lot of energy in working with young black girls and the work they're doing. Uh, I also have been heavily involved in dealing with everything from rescuing young girls from sex trafficking to counseling young girls, counseling women who have been trafficked, uh, molested, raped, and everything else. Uh, we've been doing this work for years and there's no shortage at, at, in, the, in the way of need as far as providing these services but there is a shortage of resources and so we need to be aware of that uh i'm out, i made it to the gym so i'm about to sort of wind this down man everybody's here i don't know how long i'll be here if it's this crowded um but anyway um the problem is when you don't tell someone who they are early in life as a person who loves them and as a person who wants to see them succeed, then what happens is someone else does. And when someone else does it, they do it in a manner to tell them something, uh, there's something or someone that literally will put them in a situation to do things that benefit them. And so our young men are thinking that doing, uh, you know, committing violent acts, stealing. I mean, everything that's going right now, you got young kids on this catalytic converter tip where they are literally stealing catalytic converters. And my thing is uh, people are going to start shooting because there's a lot of violence that goes behind that. You know, a sheriff's deputy got killed because he caught a kid stealing his catalytic converter and it was three of them and they exchanged fire and killed him. Um, and I'm not saying that when you get caught doing something that you shouldn't be doing, especially when you cause harm to those in the community. One of the, one of the principles in Black Men Lead and the Black Code of Conduct that we operate on at the Odyssey Project is that you bring no harm to those in your community, that you do not cause harm in any way, shape, form, or fashion, financially, physically, emotionally, or psychologically. We do not cause harm in the community, and those who cause harm in the community must be held accountable. Uh, that's absolutely uh, uh, paramount with us and you don't have to worry about saying don't do it in any other area because everybody else is going to protect their areas everybody else is going to have a standard of behavior and operation that they're going to hold everyone to including our boys when they go in there so we don't have to tell them about that they they're going to get them straight we need to teach them who they are so that they operate based on an identity 
of purpose, an identity of a <clears throat> role that they're going to play in our communities, a role that they're going to play in the collective, a role that they're going to play when they marry our daughters or when they date our daughters. They need to know how to treat a young woman. They need to know how to handle a young woman. They need to know the responsibilities that comes with connecting with a woman. You need to be a provider. You need to be a protector. You need to be a promoter. You need to be a priest. You need to be a prophet. You need to know how to speak into her life. You need to know how to talk to her. You need to know how to talk about her. You need to know a bunch of things that we're not teaching them. That's why black men lead is so important to me because we're not socializing young black males and they are taking full advantage of it. It's our responsibility to change that. And I am sitting up and saying, yes, there, there's some truth to it. Uh, we need to teach them that uh, not just the honor roll is better than death roll, but being honorable is better than the dishonor of not honoring your role as a black man. And so that's the challenge. And so once again, I'm saying, if you wanna see work done, the work has to be put in, the resources have to be there, show some love. Uh, but we need to be actively engaging our youth. If you have youth in the house, you've gotta be actively engaging them. Why? Because those devices are geared to feed them the very crap and poison that will redirect them to something that will destroy them. It's our responsibility to, to fill their time and to fill their heads with what is going to be uh, beneficial to them and their families and the community and their future. On that note, look, I'm gonna get ready to get out of here. But we need support. We need huge support. I want to see us hit a mark of $10,000 this week. And to some people that may sound crazy, to other people that may sound like what, 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 what the number of people that share videos and watch videos and the number of people that I know have capacity, it's not a problem. But the problem is we're not connected in a way that we show that kind of love. But I'm challenging everybody who watches this video. This is not the video where you look at me and say, hope somebody gives. Or, this is not the video where you pass the buck and think, well, somebody else will do it. This is the video where you sit up and say, I'm gonna be, I wanna be a part of that. I want to be a part of that. I've been hearing about this thing. If you don't believe me, do your own research. A lot of it you're gonna find is research that has been done by me or peer reviewed by me. Um, and you're gonna find out that I'm right on, that I've done the work. And you're gonna find out just, boys, uh, uh, I think I said this earlier, but black boys who are properly socialized, extremely less likely to go to prison than those that don't, that are not. More likely to become self-sufficient and be able to support themselves and their families and provide quality lives and lifestyles for their family. Um, be uh, less likely to commit violence. That's the whole thing that started this with me was African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. What was the thriving force behind it? And there were two things at the top. There were five uh, five primaries, but the two things at the top was the feeling, number one, feeling of, be feeling, feeling of being disrespected. That's a hard one to manage because it's the, uh, the, uh, respect is something that's interpreted based off your experiences. Um, and Number two, one that we could definitely control, the lack of proper socialization. When we socialize them, they are less violent. When we socialize them, they see something valuable in themselves, which mirrors in how they see one another. We've got work to do. So again, I'm challenging everybody to step up. Do not pass the buck. Do not go and think that somebody else is going to do it. See yourself as the person that can be the one that can make the difference. And so I'm challenging you now. We should make $10,000 this week. We should make that mark $10,000 this week. And you can imagine when you've got boys in every city being sent to you, that that won't go that far. But that's just a mark that I think uh, is realistic and it's a start. Because if we can get something going in that area, we can literally put something together to show more people what's possible. Uh, me doing it on my own is me taking it as it comes in a way that I can handle it. And that's minimal with everything that's coming at you. I don't have a day that I'm not being contacted where there's a need for what we do. Not one day. It's not one day where something isn't going on. But 
there has to be a means by which and through which we do this. And so I'm challenging you. On that note, look, I'm going to get out of here uh, and get in this gym and put this work in. You guys have an unbelievable day.